We're living in a time when YouTubers are becoming celebrities. Mr. Beast, Emma Chamberlain, Logan Paul, and KSI have shown us a new path to fame, fortune, and freedom. Recent studies have shown that up to 75% of children want to become YouTubers. And that brings up a major question. Is it too late to start on YouTube? Algorithmically, we are in a new paradigm that makes this a ground floor opportunity for people starting YouTube channels. Yes, competition is rising, but demand is rising even bigger. That's Sean Cannell, the founder of Think Media and the author of YouTube Secrets. Think Media has nearly two and a half million subscribers and their videos have been viewed hundreds of millions of times. Sean is one of the most respected voices in the world of YouTube, and he says that the game is changing. Success on YouTube was predicated on whether or not you have a large following or not. In fact, many people might think, well, yeah, I mean, I could be successful on social media if I have a million followers. But here's the good news. Those old rules are dying off. A lot of the social media platforms today, including YouTube, are moving away from the social graph and they're moving towards the interest graph. So in this episode, you'll learn what types of videos are doing well on YouTube today, what metrics you should be paying attention to, Sean's perfect video recipe, and the new opportunities that Sean is excited about, including Twitter. And now let's talk with Sean. When I get the question, how long should my YouTube videos be? My answer is yes. What do I mean? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the answer is in a 2023 world, the best video length is seven second shorts and 35 second YouTube shorts and 60 second YouTube shorts. Three minute clips are doing great on YouTube. Five minute and 30 second short YouTube videos are doing pretty well. You cross over eight minutes, you can do multiple ad spots. Those do great as well. There is definitely a sweet spot between 12 to 16 to 18 minutes because it's a little bit longer and YouTube loves average view duration at a higher number. So that works great well. What I'm also seeing though is that 30 minute deeper dive tutorials and education. Shane Dawson doing hour long documentaries about certain things in the entertainment space and kind of pop culture. Those are doing incredibly well. My friend Lewis Howes and Evan Carmichael are finding some of their best performing videos are two and three hour or even four hour YouTube videos. So the unfortunate answer is what is the best length for YouTube videos? Absolutely. That is exactly how long. Yeah, like you should. And what you originally said, they should be as long as they need to be, but as short as possible. That just simply means you need to honor the format and the length. An hour of boring garbage content is not going to be helpful, but an hour of a rich tutorial that makes a promise and leads you from point A to point B to point C to point D it's going to eventually, if it's good, YouTube will serve that up to people who want an hour's worth of content explaining a particular thing. I have multi, multi, multiple, multi-million viewed videos that are 45 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes of me going live. And they, they're getting two, three, four million views over a couple of years. And one of the reasons why is I'm finding the average view duration on those is 12, 14, 16 minutes. Average view duration. So as YouTube keeps showing more people these videos... I'm holding attention for 16 minutes on average, which is like three, four, five X, the average view duration of the average video on YouTube. So even though it's a, it's kind of a niche category in education, it speaks to the fact that there's a massive opportunity with long form content right now, but there's also a massive opportunity with YouTube shorts, which is the shortest form of content right now on YouTube and everything in between. <laughs> so it's a frustrating answer, but the true, the truth is you got to just develop the skill set of thinking about mastering, and I would I would argue embracing all of these content formats is relevant in a 2023 world, meaning I am particularly don't love long podcasts. Maybe if I'm running, maybe if I'm kind of stretching or something, I engage with a lot of people's shows and their clips. So when you go, you do the hour version, great. But the, the, the 10 minute, eight minute, five minute clip with the headline that I'm interested in that lets me know what the topic is, what the thing is, that's, that's one of the ways I love to engage. Some people also love shorts and they're in the shorts feed. So you're going to be the most savvy and sharp and sophisticated creator in a 2023 world when you find a way to communicate your one core message and surrounding messages that are all on brand in a YouTube shorts, in eclipse, clips, in a, low, in a short, medium, and long form content format, and even an ultra long content format, all of the above work. And it's a fascinating world to be in with YouTube right now. 
when it comes to the ideal video length. You have a you have a video pinned. Well, it's, the, it's the trailer for the channel right now talking about things that are different on YouTube and how it used to be subscribers was the way that you get views. And that's not the same right now. Can you talk a little bit about that for people who aren't familiar with the previous state of YouTube and now the current state of YouTube? And then I want to dive into that a little bit deeper. That's a great question and modern, um, very tactical right now thing to bring up. And that would be that, again, formally, and I think where most of our mindsets go, is that success on YouTube was predicated on whether or not you have a large following or not. In fact, many people might think, well, yeah, I mean, I could be successful on social media if I have a million followers. In the old world, that would be true because the way distribution on social media platforms worked was you needed a following. And if you had a following, then you posted content and your audience saw some of that content, whether that was your Facebook likes, your YouTube subscribers. Of course, organic reach on algorithms is diminished to varying degrees and typically gets lower over the years to where, like in a Facebook world, if you had 100,000 likes on your fan page, 3% or 2% or 1% or less than 1% would see a post. However, the, what would determine if more people saw it would be engagement. If it got a lot of likes, a lot of comments, a lot of people dwelling on the post or sharing it, more people would see it. But here's the good news. Those old rules are dying off. A lot of the social media platforms today, including YouTube, are moving away from the social graph and they're moving towards the interest graph. So the social graph was, well, great, you have 100,000 followers, so your social community, your community on Facebook, your community on YouTube, that's who's seeing your content. Now these platforms are serving up content based on what people are interested in. To take a slight rabbit trail to explain this and then to bring it back to why if you are just starting on YouTube, there's an opportunity, Think about your YouTube homepage right now. For anybody that watches YouTube, whether you have your own account or even if you just are not logged in, if you've watched any videos on YouTube, your homepage starts to change. So if you are like, you know what? I wanna start the keto diet. I'm thinking about doing intermittent fasting. You watch one, two, three videos about keto. What happens next? You visit your YouTube homepage. Now it's recommending other things related to keto. It might start recommending things about getting better sleep because YouTube's understanding you're interested in health in general. Now it's recommending some other things. And then they might throw you a Mr. Beast video and something else because they're also trying to lead you maybe in a new direction, but they're curating content based on your expressed interest. If you've ever been to an Airbnb, one of my favorite experiences, open up the smart TV, look at the homepage of somebody else that's been using YouTube. <laughs> Man, they were into some weird stuff. And they didn't look log out. Videos that, are, <laughs> that are being recommended to us on this homepage. You can kind of, the, uh, the, the video recommendations give you clues as to the personality, the behavior, and the interest of the person who is formerly watching the content. The reason that's an opportunity is we are living in a world where a good piece of content can go from zero to a million views in a matter of hours, days, or weeks because you tap, you strike a chord uh, into what people are interested in. And we're seeing countless examples of that. And one I talk about is Janelle Elena, who was definitely a unicorn, but with only three videos, she grew to like three million uh a million subscribers, millions of views. She had a lot of things going. She had the charisma. She had kind of the Gen Z thing, but she was doing solo female traveler van life with a pet snake. And she was type, tapping into niches. People love RV life, van life. Solo female traveler is fascinating, probably for people who aspire to do so and for weirdo guys who wanted to like, you know, watch her. And then you also had pet snake, reptile (laughs) culture. Well, these are all interests. So she's tapping into, it's authentically her, but she was tapping into the interest graph. And then the average view duration of the video and the click-through rate led her to go from zero to viral. I'm very practical in my advice to not actually promise that people are gonna have overnight riches or overnight fame with YouTube. But what listening to this, everyone is underestimating how practical it is to get 5,000 subscribers, an extra 10 to 50 leads in your business per month, an extra five to 10K of revenue in your current business by tapping into YouTube. It's not about getting a million views. It's about getting 236 views of your ideal audience, your ideal customer, and then brick by brick building up. And it's because of You don't need subscribers for what I'm describing to work. What you need is to understand who you're creating content for, who your ideal audience 
niches, what they're interested in, and creating content that they and people like them want to click on and watch. And you can start having rapid YouTube success because it's not about the social graph, it's about the interest graph. This is something I've started to understand as we've been uploading. My head, when we started thinking about YouTube, went to the same thing that a lot of people think, which is, oh, I'm too late. You know, it, the, the ship has passed. It would have been better to do it five years from now. Do you think that's still true? Or are we in a new paradigm that almost makes this like a ground floor type opportunity on YouTube? Algorithmically, we are in a new paradigm paradigm that makes this a ground floor opportunity for people starting YouTube channels. Now, I will admit everything's changed and nothing has changed. Is it too late to start a restaurant in your local city or town? No. Like you can always start a new restaurant and you could always get business, but it's also very difficult to start a restaurant. And could there be a cap on supply and demand in a local market? Certainly. So, of course, all of those market dynamics still exist. But I think what people are underestimating with YouTube is that, yes, competition is rising, but demand is rising even bigger. I think people underestimate the long tail opportunity that for everybody that has 10 million subscribers, there's hundreds that can have a million, there's thousands that can have hundreds of thousands. And then there's the long tail gets super crazy if you're in a business, we call this TAM, the total addressable market. If the total addressable market for the subject matter, for what it is that you're interested in, for what you're communicating is large enough to support the A players, B players, and C players, then absolutely, like anybody could do this. Anybody can start a profitable restaurant. Anybody can start a profitable YouTube channel if they have alignment between their skill set, their product services, whatever it is, and the market that they are in. And then it's tried and true business practices that are going to determine whether you win or not. Good marketing, understanding of your market, branding, logo, whatever else, the quality of the content itself. Uh, and then your perspicacity and your tenaciousness in terms of sticking with it. You open up your first restaurant, like any small business, one, two, three years, you're not even profitable, but you have a vision to stick with this thing and outlast the competition that gives up. You open up a new YouTube channel and people go, you know, I tried that for three months and like, it just never really hit. And you're like, what other area of life do you ever get <laughs> extraordinary results by just trying it for three months? So if you're building it on rock solid first principles, which I believe we can prove in regards to YouTube, I think it's a mindset approach of saying, okay, algorithmically there's opportunity. It is not too late to start, but I also wouldn't say it's in some fluffy, easy era of just like, I'm just uploading garbage videos and I just got a million dollars and a million views. This is just so incredible. It's funny because I know that nobody listening to this would even say that they want that and your audience much more sophisticated than that. But all of us as humans kind of fall into that. Like we're looking for, for sure. the, you know, the latest opportunity to make money with crypto as the entire crypto world <laughs> absolutely melts. Because of, I think whenever you're playing for the short term, you always lose. Whenever you're ultimately playing for the long term or, or the majority lose when you're playing for the short term. And there's a few unicorns and those are the ones that get talked about. When you play for the long term and you play by brick by brick, slow and steady wins, cream rises to the top, no matter how many cups of coffee you pour, then it works out. And and we have the, the privilege of just working with so many people that uh, or have read our book or been a part of our course or different things. We just get stories literally every day. The Think Media team, my team, we have a Slack channel just for stories of new channels, mid-tier channels that are having breakthroughs every single day. So it depends on what kind of news you're listening to. And the news we're seeing is that, no, it's not too late. It is happening as we speak. New channels are starting and succeeding in basically every niche. After a quick break, Sean and I talk about how YouTube's recommendation system works, and later we talk about the metrics and opportunities Sean is excited about right now. So stick around. We'll be right back. If you've been following me for a while, you know how much I believe in memberships as a product for creators like you and me. Earning an income directly from your audience is one of the most sustainable ways to become a professional creator. So I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Uscreen. Uscreen is a beautiful all-in-one platform that lets content creators earn a living from their videos online. You can host private live streams for your members, sell courses, even get your own branded TV and mobile apps. Seriously, people can watch your video content on an app on their TV just like Netflix. And the best part 
apart, that means unlocking predictable recurring revenue. With a Uscreen account, you get video hosting, an out-of-the-box website, full payment and subscription management, a lot of other built-in tools, and plenty of third-party integrations too. And Uscreen makes it easy to get set up. You get access to powerful website themes designed to monetize videos. It's a quick setup and fully brandable with no coding skills required. Just about anyone that wants to make money from their content can do it with Uscreen. It's perfect for coaches, authors, influencers, and entrepreneurs in just about any niche. Right now, Uscreen is being used by creators in fitness, education, news, music teachers, kids entertainment, and more. That includes Yoga with Adrian and Creator Now, just to name a couple. Uscreen is the platform for building a video membership site that is great for generating a sustainable income stream. If you create video content for your audience, I highly recommend checking it out. If you're interested in learning more about Uscreen, check out the link in the description. Welcome back to my conversation with Sean Cannell. Before I started our YouTube channel, I thought organic traffic on YouTube all came from search. But what I've realized is that recommendations on the homepage and the sidebar can sometimes account for even more organic views. So I asked Sean whether more traffic comes from recommendations or from search results. There's no question. The most powerful method or mechanism for getting views on YouTube is the YouTube suggested system. That would include homepage suggesting a video. That would include at the end of a video or beneath a video on mobile or off to the side on desktop where other videos are seen and YouTube's algorithm is studying the viewer, trying to understand what will bring satisfaction to them, what they'll wanna watch. And that's where virality happens because YouTube can then start pushing it to more and more suggested uh, you know, people's feeds. And then based on the CTR, click-through rate, People see it and people keep clicking on it and people keep watching it. And videos can go from zero to millions of views in hours. The only way that's possible is gonna be the YouTube suggested. Homepage is part of that ecosystem. And so that is the most powerful for quick traffic. Makes sense because search-based, if someone was literally typing in a phrase that they're interested in finding, that's always gonna be capped by the amount of people that search that in a day. Chances are it's not a million. It's not even probably 100,000. So that's the type of traffic that could lead to 10 views a day, 50 views a day, 100 views a day. And for us, we have different channels um, that have all kinds of different traffic sources. On our Think Media channel, search-based in a traditional sense is actually where the majority of our traffic comes from. We are an education channel that has 21 different monetization strategies that has a very slow and steady wins approach, that has a very unbreakable base of traffic that was hard to build because that slower method is reveals to you the fact we've posted 2,000 videos over the last few years and are just chipping away at dominating all kinds of long tail keyword phrases and terms. But the real answer to this is you should be playing in both camps. It's not either or, it's both and. And so we will release some videos that are also much more mystery, curiosity, click-through rate based. You, we've all seen these videos. This one secret will double your business overnight. Okay, well that's, no one is like, hey, what's the, you know, that that is, <laughs> that's playing to the clicking on it, it being recommended mentality and strategy, which is powerful. But then you have the other thing would be like how to save money on your taxes as a business owner between one and $3 million. Also powerful because someone like that'll get not YouTube is owned by Google and YouTube videos rank on Google as well. So the long tail, meaning years worth of traffic you can get for very specific search terms. And here's one of the biggest opportunities for people listening to this podcast. There is an entire wave amongst whether it's my competitors, just other people teaching YouTube who are my friends, but just other people, you know, that would be considered my competitors and people, of course, preaching the viral opportunity of YouTube, there is a wave of people just throwing out the whole traditional search methodology, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> because whenever people start, you know, just leaving opportunity on the table, I get excited because I'm willing to do the work. So if you're listening to this, I just, it, it's it's both and. and. And I think if you're prepared to go slow and steady wins, which is more of an SEO search engine optimization type of play, and you understand your entire strategy and business model, there's a lot of opportunity to be had because everyone's trying to go kind of the click bait type of uh, content, which is great, but I, I think you should be considering both. 
This is a super tactical question. I'm really well versed in Ahrefs as an SEO tool for writing articles. I know they offer uh, tooling for YouTube as well, but as someone who lives in this world and has been doing this for a long time, how do you actually do your keyword research when you're playing that side of your strategy? So my keyword research is a combination of things. I use vidIQ keyword research tool. I use vidIQ's trending tool. I will use the YouTube search bar, which would be autocomplete uh, and Google and YouTube search bar to just get a, a handle on phraseology, like how would this video be phrased? I will use tools even just like answerthepublic.com to just stimulate what is the public asking? What are the question-based topics people are looking for? That's a really good re research tool. I've been doing this for so long, I kind of feel like Luke Skywalker on the way to, to destroy the Death Star. And he finds himself, you know, finally in that X-Wing, flying down this kind of trench, and he's got all the tools in front of him, his little goggles and his dashboards that are gonna help him shoot the torpedo down this little exhaust pipe. And he's like, oh man, I hate this stuff. And then he like pulls it off and then Obi-Wan's like, use the force, Luke. And he's like, yeah, I don't need all this tech and all these, this software, I'm just gonna use the force. And where I am today is I mainly just use the force. <laughs> and what I, what I mean by that is I kind of pop around on some of these different tools, but a lot of it is, intuition and listening to your audience and understanding if you know the words and the way your audience talks because you're having conversations with your customers or your community, if you've been doing something for a while, here's the quote, the creator who understands the viewer best wins, period. Not to be self-referential, but I believe that is my quote, but I did steal it from some business guru who said, the business owner who understands the customer best wins. Period. Like, because if you understand the customer and their ambitions and their pains and what keeps them up on night, then you're going to, and you then make a great product and have great marketing that speaks to that. They say, right, like you will close like a sales call if you can articulate the problem that the customer is having better than they can. That is understanding, like you're in their mind, you're in their psychology. So that doesn't really happen from software. And I know there's Jasper copywriting software and stuff, and who knows, maybe it will happen eventually. And and then at that point, the machines will kill us because if it gets that smart. But I do think it's really, if you're tuned into what is on your ideal audience's mind, what are their pro pain points, problems, ambitions, what's keeping them up, up at night, and you do your due diligence to study copywriting, a, a decent amount of just understanding marketing, and you're a decent writer in terms of writing titles and headlines, then it's the combination of those skill sets that that lead to crushing it from a search-based and algorithm. And you can do a mix of both. I, you can write keyword-rich titles that are inspiring to click, that also have some mystery and curiosity to them. It's a whole art form. And so it kind of all sounds like a flex, but it just is me just been doing this for a while. I can, at this point, sort of just sit down and content sort of comes out. And, and I, I also want to overemphasize that if you listen enough, which you need an audience in the first place to do this, but if you have a community tab, which now just a few hundred subscribers on YouTube, you, you can have a community tab, which is like a Facebook feed in a way, you can ask questions there. If you have any kind of following on Twitter and you, you can listen to your DMs, you can listen to your comments elsewhere, and you can listen to the comments on your YouTube videos and the comments on other people's videos if you don't have an audience. Getting a pulse on what is the zeitgeist, what's the psychology of the community you're communicating with, and then knowing how to package content to speak to that, that's what I really feel like is going to be winning in a 2023 world. It's what we're experiencing. And so I love the tools, but it's the tools meets the intuition and skill set that just comes from repetition and doing this a lot and sharpening. It's basically like your hard and soft skills, sharpening your hard skills and sharpening your soft skills of like communication, psychology, empathy, understanding audiences, talking to them, love, caring about the audience and, and mixing those with some of the cool tools that are out there. You opened up a bunch of open loops that I want to dive down, but I'm going to hold on a few of them here and ask a really basic question that I'm sure has a really complex answer, but I think it's important for us to talk about it, which is what gets suggested by YouTube? You've mentioned that there are all these places where YouTube suggests things, but how do you get suggested by the algorithm? Number one, you need to create content that people actually want to watch. 
if you start with what do you want to create first, which is tricky because it is YouTube, it's your tube. And plenty of people have gotten famous just like talking about their ideas. But the biggest mistake I see in our community, and I coach people all day long and we have different groups and stuff, is people are making selfish content. They're like, yeah, so I just kind of want to start a channel. Here's what I want to talk about. Here's what you know I want to say. Here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what's on my mind today. It sounds like there's a bird in a Pixar movie, I think Finding Nebo, that just says me, 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 me all the time, I think, right? And, and, and that's why you're losing because you're making selfish content and you're only thinking about yourself. The flip side is if you make service content, it means you become obsessed with the viewer. You, you become obsessed with what do audiences want. Saying that, the best way to know what content would be suggested on YouTube would be to start with some research. How do I do market research? Go on YouTube and search different niches. Start exploring and going down the rabbit hole to determine are people interested in learning about Cinema 4D? Oh, wow. This channel's got 100,000 views. This channel's got 400,000 views. There's 500,000 views on these videos. Interesting. Are people interested in learning about Microsoft Word? Oh, wow, I didn't even know there's this channel with a million subscribers. And of course, like almost any topic you could think about, but that's what's, what's gonna determine one big signal of how big you could grow a YouTube channel is do any YouTube channels exist of what size based on the thing you wanna create? So if you're thinking about starting a tech channel, pretty good niche because if MKBHD has 15 million subscribers, you getting 150 is actually pretty practical if you stick with it. So what gets suggested, of course there's weird pockets of just random Gen Z YouTube shorts, what are we even watching of, of entertainment-based stuff, which that's a whole other side of it, would be the entertainment, sure, dancing, sure, meme, meme-type content. But what gets suggested is what people are interested in, and it's 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 what there's a market for, a total addressable market. And, and then that's the exciting thing, because once you find a pool of a particular type of a topic. So it could be, you could be like, is anybody into biohacking? Is anybody studying red light therapy, cryo, nootropics? Sure enough, yeah, there's channels. And then you're like, okay, this is maybe the Tim Ferriss world, the Dave Asprey bulletproof coffee world. And then there's all kinds of, like, it's like a mind map. You can spin off. What gets suggested then is understanding people and understanding kind of the mind map of people, which is, yeah, I personally am also describing myself. And by the way, one of the best ways to start a YouTube channel is to make a channel for you one to two years ago. I know I said selfish for service, but if you think about the viewer first, but you serve out of your own expertise, passion, curiosity, then you're gonna have a winning combination there. So I don't actually do anything biohacking related, but I believe I could be very successful in that niche. Why? Because I'm the guinea pig. I have red light therapy panels on my walls. I read about it, I study about it, I geek out with other people. People, we're trying to do cold plunges now. You know, we're getting into all kind of weird stuff. What's happening in stem cells? What's happening in, I'm, I'm, I just bought Liver King supplements, man. I'm, I'm, I'm eating <laughs> testicle now. Like, it's like I got, I got liver, you know, bovine testicle in my diet now. I'm buying real liver from the butcher. So, and, and like, and then you can start digging. If you are also a consumer, if you're an intentional consumer, that's a big mistake people make and why they fail on YouTube is they don't even consume YouTube. They haven't even done like step one of Sun Tzu, Art of War, like understand the enemy, like actually go study the battlefield. Like actually go look at that your niche or your potential niche to see, okay, this kind of content's working. This is what's happening. And then you're also seeing how much interest there is. It's like seeing just because there's 10 coffee shops in your city, it's not an indication that you should not start a coffee shop. It probably is an indication that you should because there's so much demand for coffee. And, and so that's, I think the exciting part is realizing the demand that these different subcultures and sub niches have endless like weird pockets of, of deeper nuance, for example, biohacking, superhuman, Dave Asprey, and all this different stuff that you could, you could create niches within niches. And then what gets suggested, what gets suggested, long answer to your question, is, is that once YouTube discerns that me, Sean Cannell, is a weird biohacking guy, and I watched 
Rogan talk about some new tropics and then started watching a Dave Asprey video and then learned 10 facts about cold plunge, YouTube knows a lot about me. So they will recommend me other stuff in that. They start realizing the way the algorithm rhythm works is, okay, this particular person, we're gonna recommend them three videos. Wow, they clicked on these two videos and they watched almost to the end. Okay, we're learning more about them. We're learning more about this other person. And it's a web of interconnected communication that's trying to kind of profile and stereotype people in a good way, because now it's understanding your user behavior, what you're interested, what's providing satisfaction. And therefore, the opportunity for the creator is to understand audiences. The creator who understands the audience best wins, because if you tap into, that's why I would love to start a new tropics, biohacking, health-related channel, because of who I could interview, because of the topics I could talk about, because of what I'm doing myself, because of the affiliate marketing opportunities there, because the brand deal opportunities there. Like it's a whole business model that I could print based on my experience up until this point, I got plenty to do and I'm not doing that at this point. And if somebody wants to steal that idea and it resonates with my weird obsessive behaviors, then by all means, <laughs> please take the idea. But but it's it's sort of like, you know, inevitable that it would succeed if you could create some decent content. And this is business 101. It's supply and demand. There is demand for nootropic, biohacking, Tony Robbins' new book, book, Life Force, all this new stuff in health. There's demand for it. And there's lots of content out there, but there's more demand than content. And so you could have all kinds of opportunity to create that. That's where your suggested is gonna be used to your advantage. Let's say that I've done a good job of looking at the battlefield, seeing what's out there, identifying something that does have demand, and it feels like my videos aren't getting views. It sounds like from the people I've talked to, things I should be paying attention to are AVD, average view duration, and click-through rate, CTR. Is that the system that you also believe in? And if so, could you expand on how we can pull those levers to try and, and move in the right direction to what YouTube wants? Yes, it's in an oversimplification, that would be true. And it is true, because those are the metrics. You still might understand those metrics, but not be getting the result. So the conversation needs to broaden a little bit. And, you know, in our book, uh, YouTube Secret Second Edition, we talk about the perfect video recipe. And the perfect video recipe is the big idea, the hook, the content, and the transition. We start with the big idea, and the big idea is where the opportunity lies. The big idea includes three things, the title, the thumbnail, but in my opinion, most importantly, the topic itself. So click-through rate in AVD, I've seen channels, they go, my click-through rate is 66%, which is insane. And I'm like, well, yeah, you have 100 subscribers, they're all really engaged, but you're not growing. But like everybody who's there is clicking. So I mean, so so it's such a broad number, mm -hmm. you can't really narrow it down. Like click-through rate on, on, on videos that I have that have millions of views is 2%. But it's being, it gets 10,000 impressions an hour and 2% of 10,000 impressions keep clicking on it for the last five years. So click-through rate is driven down as videos succeed more. Average view duration also gets driven down. It's how, what's its resilience? How, how much can it hold as it keeps being expanded to wider audiences? So if, if you're stuck, it comes back to, unfortunately, it comes back to like 87 different things. You know, whether it's like we can look at the content itself, editing, but the, the biggest opportunity, I would argue, is topic. Meaning, you could be, a channel is doing an interview show, and they interview somebody once a week, and they're uploading 45-minute podcasts and video podcasts, and they always have an interview show, they have kind of a broad title, and they're like, I feel stuck. So what is some of the opportunity? Well, the opportunity would be, number one, chopping down clips out of that maybe and going different formats four minute videos, eight minute videos, 12 minute videos, and not just 45 minute videos. If you somebody commentated on a very unique business insight around Amazon being the first company to ever lose a, a trillion dollars in market cap, and what you might notice I'm talking about influence surfing and trend surfing here, meaning I'm talking about news, hot topics. Let's focus on the word, topic. So channels breakout opportunity is tapping into some hot topics. Let me give another example that might resonate with your audience. There's a lot of digital agencies out there, a lot of digital advertising agencies, and they want more clients. And they're talking about like four tips for how to run a Facebook ad. They're talking about seven things business owners should know about Facebook ads. And they're making this kind of like content. That's fine, kind of boring. And they're getting kind of boring results. When iOS 14 rolled out originally, 
And every digital marketer lost their mind because now you weren't going to have information and targeting was going to be messed up and what was going to be happening. That was the topic that every agency should have been talking about. 99.9% .9 were not. So that's why they were losing. So everyone's out here. I'm uploading videos. I'm interviewing somebody. I'm talking about valuable stuff. And it's like, yeah, and that that has its place. But that, that it's also hard to get results with that when no one knows you yet. So how do you break out of obscurity? You got to start playing a strategic game with topics that could give you awareness and growth and discoverability. You also should probably never leave that strategy, but fast forward to having 10,000 or 100,000 subscribers. Of course, you could just put out really quality content and interviews with people, but how do you get discovered in the first place? That's going to most likely happen from talking about the right thing. And trend surfing and influencing, influence surfing would be your best strategy. To be even more specific, we recently had our first really viral TikTok, and I know we're talking about YouTube, oh, but it got 26 million views. So I interviewed Patrick by David, who's a master at this, and he has a channel called Valuetainment. And in my interview of him, I was very intentional to just create, bring a list of topics to bring up to him. Mm. So I was like, hey, Mr. Beast, uh, sold his company or got offered a billion dollars for his company. What do you have to say about it? And his response and that clip got 26 million views. Not only that, if we spin off into some niche strategy, we now post vertical videos on TikTok, Facebook Reels, slept on opportunity, Pinterest vertical video, nobody knew that was happening, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, and LinkedIn. Yes, every the way we post it is intentional, but it's the same vertical video across platforms, which is an incredibly leveraged opportunity. All that to say is it's like the 15 million views on Facebook, 26 million views on, it actually only got 125,000 views on, on YouTube. But here's the point, it was the topic. And and the, the vertical video before that was on whatever, three tips for how to get more YouTube views, which is great, that's what I teach but also might be, it's more saturated. It's more like, yes, my subscribers and diehard audience want to click on that, but we've also heard that before. But guess what? News and trends, you've never could say you've heard that before because they're always happening in real time. Like we didn't know FTX was going to absolutely bomb and everyone's putting out great stories about it right now. And whoever, the dude that just lost $16 billion, like super fascinating. Cold Fusion's videos got like a couple million views. It came out like yesterday. Topic, like they're talking about what's happening in the world. And then the key here, because the listener might say, yeah, but like, I'm not just a, tr I'm not a news company. I'm not just going to follow trends. The art form is figuring out which topics can be related to whatever it is you're trying to do in your business or whatever channel you're trying to grow. Maybe you shouldn't talk about technology, but there's hot topics in health. There's hot topics in relationship. There's trending people in all these spaces. That's the skill set, my friend, of like, of cracking out of being stuck in your views. And it's not even something you have to do forever. Everybody listening to this is one video away, one video away from changing their life, their business, and the YouTube channel they start forever. Because one video can put you on the map so that just your day-to-day -day passion of slow and steady valuable content now has awareness that you even exist. But this art form of tapping into understanding trending topics, and again, iOS 14, like that's not like a trending topic, it's just affected all marketers and businesses, so it was the right thing to talk about. My friend comes to Vegas every year to a concrete con convention. Uh, he owns a concrete company. I didn't even know there could be a convention. I'm like, what's happening in concrete? Is there that much innovation? <laughs> Apparently, tens of thousands of people with booths that are buzzing at the bar at five o'clock. Dude, did you see what's happening? Every industry has relevant top of mind things people are thinking about. It is your job listening to this to be an expert marketer and content creator to learn this skill set. That's how you're going to win outpace your competition, continue to dominate, and recession-proof your business. Because if you understand, understand this, you're going to be unstoppable. So how are you and your team thinking about the future of video on Twitter now that Elon has taken over and said that that might be a priority? I'm thinking about going all in. I mean, I know Elon was like, as of this exact moment, we can upload 45 minutes. Like if he was to open that up in the past, I would always get a little anxious, a little frustrated. I would wake up when something new would come along. I'd wake up and I'd be like, 
dude, my back hurts. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Pinterest does vertical video now. You know, I've got a 10 week old boy and a two year old boy. And I'd be like, give me a break. Like I, I'm, I can't handle this. I don't want another thing. If you're listening to this as a solo creator in the side hustle season, you got to be very selective with your time and your energy and how you're, where you're deploying that. But I'm in an opportunity where I have leverage, leverage of in two forms, dollars and human resources and the ability to deploy dollars to hire more human resources via that W-2 employee contractor or agency. So the op I just am experiencing the positive ROI of investing in more content done properly, and that'd be the huge key. So I just think about Twitter as another mountain to tackle. And I guess maybe a nuanced personal answer to that question. There's a great book called Who Not How, and the wrong question entrepreneurs ask is, man, how am I going to embrace Twitter video? I'm too busy. How am we going to, how are we going to actually take the videos we're doing and chop them up for Twitter? How are we going to figure out best practices on Twitter? And it's the wrong question. The right question is who is going to run Twitter for my business? I think there's, there, it's a worthwhile thought exercise to think of every social media platform almost as its own business. Like right now I pay an agency $4,000 to make me one TikTok a day. That is 31 TikToks a month. And by the way, it is a TikTok. They're logged in, they upload it. But it's, what does that even mean? It's actually just a vertical video. And guess what? We use those on the other six platforms I mentioned. Here's my question then. What's the ROI of that? The ROI is measured by linking bio clicks, which are terrible, by the way, Linktree on, on TikTok. Follower growth. So then I ask, okay, can I do brand deals? I was just reached out from somebody that wants to pay us specifically to do brand deals on TikTok. Hmm. Okay, so, and by the way, so if I didn't make money even up front, am I willing to invest that money for a couple months to then ROI that later? So then I'm like, okay. Then I think about what's just the brand lift, maybe hard to measure, maybe nearly impossible to measure from discoverability of my face, our content awareness, that then oh, I've seen that person and just how many brand impressions does it take to build trust and they maybe meet us on another platform. You don't really move audiences, like we don't move audiences from TikTok to YouTube, it doesn't happen. It, there might be some brand transfer, but, but then the easy one for me was, okay, but yes, because we get these vertical video assets, we upload those on Facebook Reels. Facebook Reel just got 10 million views. That audience may or may not be targeted with paid media but I just got 14 new thousand Facebook likes per week. So I could follow up with retargeting and paid ads to a direct ROI of the vertical creative that we paid the agency to make on TikTok. So the long tail uh, is, is, okay, so I'm investing real dollars on TikTok as a small business owner would at a potential negative for one, two, three, four, five, six months. But as a system is built around that, that now is also expanding that TikTok across multiple platforms to attribute ROI back to, you know, aforementioned, uh, however far back you wanna trace that. And then you fast forward to TikTok earning money in and of itself. I bring, I apply all of that to Twitter to say, okay, maybe it's a social media admin I just looked it up in Nevada. The salary of a social of, of a social media administrative or administrative assistant is thirty eight thousand dollars or something like that. So could forty thousand dollars a year be deployed for someone to eat, sleep, breathe, and live Twitter only? I don't even know what they would do all day at this point, but it's a good thought exercise. And then say that person probably would do multiple things if they're also coming in. That's good, but that's a lower wage. But if they want to come in and hustle for the leadership development of working with Think Media and, and then grow into 50, 60 and beyond and pr some profit share, some other things, I would think about adding more personnel, more manpower. I believe that social media in a 2023 world is a team sport. If you're going to execute, especially across multiple platforms, so that's a long answer to how I'm thinking about Twitter. No doubt about it, I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking about who, not how. I'm thinking about if we're gonna do the platform right and if we could attribute ROI to the platform and if we could take even a risk on it because for the smart entrepreneur with resources, if we bet 40K in a salary and I don't know, another 10, 20, 30 on, on content or whatever, you know, I don't know. And we lost, I'm betting on my own business. Like I'm betting on Twitter. It's like opening a division. I'm gonna experiment on Twitter because Elon's there and let's play and let's get the check mark or you can't get the check mark. I don't even know. Let's open more Twitter accounts. Let's open some, <laughs> you know, you, you could do some different things. Uh, 
that that I think we're playing in a world where it's worth thinking this way. And of course, it's self-awareness about where you're at. I'm, I'm recognizing I'm a very niche use case in everything I just described. But for the new person starting, it could be new ground that you bet on because it's going to change with Elon there and you do invest more energy. But uh, yeah, we're in a complex world of time, money, and resource allocation. And in my opinion, that's the question as it pertains to Twitter. Not whether or not you should do it or not, the answer would be yes, it's just what are your other competing objectives, platforms, and where would that sit in your queue? And maybe you don't have the bandwidth to get to it. Maybe we don't. I'm asking how can we create that by the deploying of our resources? I've heard you mention a couple times now Facebook Reels, and you talked about that in your interview with Chris Doe as well. I just thought that Facebook Reels were pulled over from Instagram Reels, and I'm realizing that I think I'm completely wrong. So can you talk a little bit about Facebook Reels and and where they live and how that works? Number one, Jay, I have no idea, okay? Uh, (laughs) Number two, I recently posted some Reels natively on Instagram and they didn't get pulled over and I was super frustrated because then I was like, how do I even download this and post this and the music is native and there's software that can strip the music, but then is it, if it's not done properly, is it gonna get a copyright strike because it wasn't through the platform? So that was an unhelpful answer. What I can tell you is you can upload them natively as well. They can get pulled over from Instagram. That would be your highest leverage. You absolutely should do that. By the way, you should also connect up your stories. So for most people, just to create as much leverage as possible, do Instagram well. Connect Instagram to Facebook so that reels you post on Instagram also go to Facebook. And actually, maybe I'm answering my own question. There was a point where Facebook reels were only 30 seconds. So 60 wouldn't go, but if it was 30, it would. And maybe that's why it didn't. This this would all be frustrating to the listener, but I think the bigger principle is the, is is commitment. And what we, I think, meet, I think our philosophy is we are committed and convinced of the simplest way to summarize it would be a classic term to just say in content marketing, like content marketing works, digital advertising works. Like, so we're committed to that, but then realizing that like the moving target of understanding formats, what's working now, what are the best practices at this moment, what's happening that's new. And again, I think it was Brian who told me, he goes, did you know there's Facebook Reels? And again, I was recently on a trip and someone was like, you've heard about Pinterest vertical video? And they had gotten $13,000 over the last, you know, six months from the Pinterest vertical video beta creator fund. And I was like, what are you talking about? Back to it. My back hurts, dude. I don't need another platform. What are you you talking about? But, and then I was, you know, I I get discouraged and overwhelmed and anxious for 10 minutes. And then my mind flips into, okay, let's, let's giddy up, you know, let's figure out not. And then it's kind of like the book, rich dad, poor dad, you know, his poor dad would say, we can't afford it. And the rich dad would say, how can we afford it? That's the mindset everybody listening to this needs to have. It's, Oh, wait, you know, not, ah, uh, I can't do another platform. It's how could I embrace that platform? And then better questions. How could I do it simply? How could I do it without much more work? How could I connect? If How could I just connect my Facebook fan page, take the 22 minutes to figure that out to my Instagram so that I just keep doing the exact same thing I'm doing and I have this benefit. And then I ignore it for a year, forgot I was even posting Facebook reels, And then look back and be like, oh my gosh, one went viral. It got 422,000 views. And that's like crazier than anything I've happened. I got 5,000 new likes. Where did this flood of new people calling us or emailing us or wanting to work with us or hire us come from? Because I set up systems and I took some time to just embrace the opportunities that are coming on these platforms. I hope you learned as much from this conversation as I did. Sean clearly believes that there is still a great opportunity to get started on YouTube. And after eight months of building this channel, I would have to say that I agree with him. If you want to learn more about Sean, find Think Media TV here on YouTube or check out his book, YouTube Secrets. Links to all of that are in the show notes. Thanks to Sean for being on the show. Thank you to Connor Conboy for editing the video for this episode. Thank you to Emily Klaus for making the artwork for this episode. Thanks to Nathan Tonhunter for mixing the show and Brian Skeel for creating our music. If you like this episode, you can tweet at Jay Klaus and let me know. And if you really want to say thank you, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.